Hello and welcome to our final video lesson on Chapter 18, Nitrogen Metabolism, in which we'll consider the urea cycle. Let's first establish the fact that we do need to get rid of amine groups that result from amino acid catabolism. We can't afford to stockpile ammonia or ammonium ion. High concentrations are toxic. It causes alkalosis, a dangerously higher alkaline pH. Ammonia can also enter the brain and combine with alpha-ketoglutarate to form glutamate. This depletes citric acid cycle intermediates and severely compromises the catabolism within the brain. Glutamate is also a neurotransmitter and so we also might disrupt those interactions. And so therefore we need to incorporate ammonia into a molecule that is non-toxic just as we had to assimilate it into such a form. Most of the nitrogen that is excreted as waste is done so in the form of urea depicted here. As you can see, a ketone group with amine groups on either side. Glutamate dehydrogenase reaction is the major way that we feed amine groups into the urea cycle. It's a rather unusual enzyme in that it can use either NAD or NADP as a cofactor as depicted here. First glutamate is oxidized to form the intermediate shown in brackets and then the amine group is released through hydrolysis with the formation of alpha-ketoglutarate. You'll notice in this reaction we've released the amine group from glutamate, but we still haven't incorporated it into a urea molecule. The first real step in that process is the carbonyl phosphate synthetase reaction. This is a synthetase, so it will need a nucleotide triphosphate. In this process, we begin with bicarbonate that becomes activated by phosphoryl group transfer, as noted in step one. Bicarbonate, the phosphoryl group, terminal phosphate of ATP is transferred to the carboxyl group of bicarbonate, forming our carboxyphosphate intermediate. The carbonyl carbon carrying that partial positive charge is therefore under nucleophilic attack from the nitrogen in our the amine group we just released from glutamate and the result is the formation of carbamate with the release of inorganic phosphate. Now we see why we had to activate that bicarbonate first so that we could break the phosphoester bond in order to form that amide bond. So it costs us one molecule of ATP. In the next step we phosphorylate carbamate to form carbamoyl phosphate and that costs us our second molecule of ATP. So for every molecule of carbamoyl phosphate, it costs us two molecules of ATP. Here we have the overview of the urea cycle, and it is a cyclic pathway. Just as all cyclic pathways, we begin and end at the same spot. In this case, we begin with the molecule ornithine. Our first substrate entering the pathway is the carbamoyl phosphate we just synthesized. Remember that amine group came from glutamate. In step one, we simply add that carbamate group to the end nitrogen of ornithine to form citrulline and we release inorganic phosphate in the process. Our next amine donor comes from aspartate. Argininosuccinate synthetase enzyme adds this aspartate amino acid, the entire amino acid, to that carbonyl carbon of citrulline to form argininosuccinate, a rather complex molecule. You'll notice in this case that it is a synthetase enzyme and it uses the energy from ATP. In this case, we have to hydrolyze two phosphoanhydride bonds and so it costs us two ATP equivalents to add that aspartate. In step three, we hydrolyze a portion of the argininosuccinate molecule to release fumarate. Recall from chapter 14 that fumarate can feed into the citric acid cycle to be converted to malate and then subsequently to oxaloacetate. Continuing in the urea cycle, with the hydrolysis of fumarate, we form the amino acid 
arginine. And in our last step, we hydrolyze the end group from arginine to release our final product, urea, and regenerate our starting molecule, ornithine. In this process, it's not important you remember every step. Remember this, the starting molecule and ending molecule is ornithine. Our primary entry point is carbamoyl phosphate, and that amine group came from glutamate. Our second amine group came from aspartate. And in the process, we not only formed urea, but we can also recycle a portion of the aspartate molecule in the form of fumarate into the citric acid cycle. Let's consider the cost of running the cycle. It costs two ATP molecules for every molecule of carbamoyl phosphate and two ATPs for every aspartate. So it took us, cost us four ATP molecules to make one urea molecule. So clearly an expensive process and yet we do gain the production of an amine molecule that we can excrete as waste without building up that toxic ammonia compound. How do we control the, the urea cycle? It's controlled mostly by the activity of the carbamoyl phosphate synthetase that generated our primary molecule to enter into the pathway. Remember, we started with glutamate as our amine donor. Glutamate can be acetylated to form N-acetylglutamate. If the concentration of glutamate within the cell is high and the concentration of acetyl-CoA is high, then we form a large concentration of N-acetylglutamate. And this is a key that tells us that we have a high concentration of amine donors to feed into the cycle. And so N-acetylglutamate stimulates the activity of carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. And therefore we get plenty of product to feed into the urea cycle. The urea is then transported through the bloodstream to the kidneys for excretion. Some organisms such as bacteria, fungi, and others have an enzyme known as urease in which they can convert urea to ammonia and then excrete that directly from the cell. These are simpler organisms and we do not have this enzyme as mammals. That concludes our studies for chapter 18 and our next video lesson will begin our studies of chapter 19. We want to look at some of the general ways that mammalian metabolism is regulated on a more system-wide scale.